Croiso, Fulcher, Denach, Fulcher Ort, Demat. Welcome, welcome to the Celtic Myths and Legends podcast. My name is Sean Esther Powell, and I'll be taking you on a journey through all the myths and legends of the six Celtic nations. So that's Cornwall, Wales, Ireland, Scotland, Brittany, and the Isle of Man. Hello, everyone, lovely listeners, gorgeous people. Today we are on to our next Scottish episode, so those of you who have listened to the podcast before know that I talk about one of the six Celtic nations every episode, but if you haven't listened to me before, then what are you doing? Go back and listen to them all. Um, This is going to be a really fun episode, not a lot of waffle to begin with, I'm going to kind of launch straight into it for once, so I know that there's going to be some of you that are like, thank goodness. Like, that girl can talk. I can. So we are going to be doing a bit of a storytelling um, episode today. So I'm going to have some nice ambient Celtic music in the background as well later. Um, It's going to be really good. Of course, public domain. What do you take me for? I'm going to be reading from Douglas Alexander Mackenzie's um, The Wonder Tales of Scotland. I'm going to be reading from Donald Alexander Mackenzie's The Wonder Tales from Scottish Myth and Legend. It was published in 1917. Um, I believe that Mr Mackenzie um, died in 1936, so it should be in public domain. I'm getting I'm reading from sacredtexts.com, so um, a really incredibly impressive body of public domain works, um, you know, concerning folklore, mythology and all sorts of esoteric subjects on that website. So I'm sure that if you're interested in that sort of thing, you already know about that website. But if you don't, um, it's where I go to to read um, quite a few of the things that I've talked about before, actually. Um, But here we go. We are going to be talking about nimble men, blue men and green ladies. When I say talking about, I'm going to be reading from that chapter and then we're going to sort of discuss it a little bit afterwards. Before I launch into it first, however, um, just to give you a bit of a preface, nimble men is another way of describing the aurora borealis or the northern lights and the folklore associated with the northern lights in Scotland. So Donald Alexander Mackenzie was a a rather prolific um, Scottish writer and um, folklorist actually journalist as well and he didn't only cover Scotland he covered a lot of different cultures he wrote books on Russian mythology Egyptian mythology Chinese mythology and he had lots of different kind of historical and archaeological theories as well and a lot of um, anthropological theories Um, but we of course, because I am the Celtic Myths and Legends podcast. And although I am personally very interested in all the cultures of the world and all of the mythology and folklore of these different cultures, um, I am not equipped to talk about them. I am just merely talking about Celtic Myths and Legends. So we are, of course, going to focus on the Scottish Myths and Legends. Um, he was very prolific, as I said, wrote a lot of books, wrote you know Scottish fairy tales, the wonder... Um, tales of Scottish myths and legends. In fact, I think, I believe that they actually are both the same novel and both the same collection of fairy tales that, um, but he was living in the early 20th century and 19th and the late 19th century as well. So a little bit of a, a little bit of background knowledge for you there. He was a very interesting person, you know, broadcasted talks on Celtic mythology, has a very impressive, huge body of work um, behind him. So without further ado, this is chapter five of Donald Alexander Mackenzie's The Wonder Tales from Scottish Myth and Legend. Among the children and descendants of Beira are the nimble men or merry dancers, Aurora Borealis, the blue men of the Minch and the green ladies. The nimble men are divided into two clans, The heroes of one clan are clad in garments white as hoarfrost, and the heroes of the other clan in garments of pale yellow. 
Brighter and more varied colours are worn by the ladies of the clans. Some are gowned in green, some in red, and some in silvery white, and a few wear royal purple. On winter nights, when there is peace on land and sea, the nimble men and merry maidens come forth to dance in the northern sky. They are all of giant stature, but comely of form, and their dances are very graceful. The men bow to the maids, and the maids curtsy to the men. And when the dance is at its height, some of the men leap high and whirl around about. So merry do they become. Fairy pipers play enchanting music, while the merry couples dance across the northern sky. There was once a prince of the white clan of nimble men, and his name was Lightfoot. He loved the princess Comely, who was the fairest of all the merry maidens, and he had a rival named Green Eyes, the chief of the yellow clan. Princess Comely liked best to dance with Lightfoot, because among the nimble men, he was without an equal as a dancer. One dark night, when the mountains were white, with new fallen snow and the valleys glistened with hoarfrost. All the northern sky was lit up in splendour by the nimble men and merry maidens who came out to dance in honour of Queen Beira. It was the first great gathering of the winter season and all of the dancers were clad in new and dazzling garments. They began to dance soon after darkness set in and it was nigh to midnight ere they sank down to rest. Princess Comely had danced all the time with Lightfoot and when she sat down he knelt before her whispering softly, Fairest of the fair, oh be my bride! said Princess Comely, your bride I shall be. The words were heard by Green Eyes, who was crouching near at hand. His heart was filled with anger, and leaping up, he called upon the members of his clan to draw their swords and fight. Lightfoot and his followers, then all was confusion. The warriors both the warriors of both clans sprang at one another, brandishing their gleaming weapons. Up leapt Lightfoot to fight against Green Eyes. Raising to full stature, he darted across the sky to smite him down. Up leapt the Princess Comely and all the maidens and ran away shrieking. Then a battle royale began to rage between the rival clans. The sound of swords, striking swords, reached the earth and seemed like the rustling of frosty twigs when the wind rises suddenly and scampers through the forest. For hours the fearsome fight was waged with fury and the men and women came forth to watch it with wonder and in silence. They saw the warriors leaping white with anger, hard and swift were the blows, and many were slain. At length below the feet of the nimble men there appeared a cloud which was red with the blood that flowed from many wounds received in the battle royale. From the sky the blood drops fell like dew on the green stones of the mountain which were thus forever stained with red spots. That is why the red speckled green stones are called blood stones. When the night was almost spent, Princess Comely returned to the battleground and found that the conflict had come to an end. As she drew near, a few wounded warriors rose up and staggered away. She began to search among the fallen warriors for Lightfoot, and at length she found him lying cold and dead. A cry of sorrow broke from her lips and was wafted towards the earth on the first breath of dawn. Those who heard it knew that when the prophecy of the seer was being fulfilled and they sang the song that he had made. When your lady sings her lover in the cold and early moon, she There 
there you have it. A lot of reverb on that, a lot of echoes. And um, that wasn't quite the whole chapter, but it was the section on the nimble men. So <laughs> I'm very sorry to have to put you through my awful singing. Um, I think we're going to take this chapter piece by piece because it would be quite nice to do the whole chapter. Um, but I hope you, I hope you could tell how much editing went went in on that. I was doing like effects, sound effects, pieces of music, like oh my god. And now it's all downhill from, from now on, guys, just to let you know. It's all just um, waffle from here on out. So let's just sort of dissect what we've just uh, listened to there. So as I mentioned at the start of the episode, the nimble men are the northern lights. Um, I believe the blue men are as well and we will get around to them in just a moment. But there is lots of folklore associated with the northern lights um, in, across all different cultures. Um, but as we are on the Scottish episode and I was looking for something to, to really talk about and when I was looking through um, his collect that Donald Alexander Mackenzie's collection of folk tales and things like that. I was coming across mermaids and I was coming across all these lovely um, folkloric creatures, but some of which we kind of covered before a little bit. I'm not saying that I won't cover them again in future, but I wanted something a little bit different. And I guess kind of like a weather phenomenon is not something we've really um, honed in on a lot, have we? And I've got, I, I you know, a part of my, um, love of folklore is its connections to weather and landscape and how that affects folk tales. So it's quite interesting that that hasn't really factored into my own podcast all that much. I think this might end up being a rather short episode. I think we're on 12 minutes already and I've spent, <laughs> I've spent hours um, on this with like the sound effects and stuff like that. By the way, I got really excited, as you can probably tell. Uh, I got a subscription to Audio Blocks with like a whole host of royalty free music and sound effects. Um, so I really want to thank my patrons really, really quickly in the middle of the episode. I'm sorry, I hate doing that, but also I don't hate doing that because thank you so much without you, um, you know, pledging and, you know, passing your hard on earned money to me. And um, I wouldn't be able to do things like that, you know, to get subscriptions to services and software that really helps my podcast grow and develop and get better and whatever. But thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to thank everyone individually at the end of this episode. So weather and landscape, how does it affect folklore and the stories we tell? Well, completely. Look, if you think about it, folk tales and storytelling was people's way of kind of making sense of the world around them. With If you didn't have any scientific learning, that is. Um, and a lot of these explanations are actually kind of logical in their own way. They do have their own internal logic, like dragons living in volcanoes and nimble men fighting in the sky do you know what I mean it's all it's stuff that has its own its own internal logic it makes its own kind of sense so you can't mock it why would you mock it these beautiful stories that help us really make sense of the world that we live in and as I have said many times before you've heard me say it many times that one of my favorite things about folklore and myths and legends is that you can trace similarities across cultures across across the world but each place still maintains its own kind of individuality because of its landscape for example and because of cultural differences maybe belief differences all sorts of things but for the most part landscape features very strongly in our stories and makes them quite unique and it really holds up a mirror um, and shows us, or folklore holds up, holds up a mirror to us and shows us how we viewed the world in the past and in some cases still do. So the nimble men and there's also the blue men, you think about it when you think about the aurora borealis, they're the blue lights and colours in the sky and the red kind of speckles are the blood of the fallen in battle. Now. I mean, don't you think that's actually so 
beautiful and gorgeous and so insanely human that we would look at lights in the sky, no matter how beautiful those lights are, but we would look at dancing lights in the sky and attribute romance and war and death and sorrow and pain and beauty. The, the poetry in some of that writing, you know, like swords sounding like frosted twigs in the woodland is just like gorgeous. It, it kind of makes you love humanity sometimes, doesn't it, reading these stories? Because, you know, you have natural phenomena and the poetry and the beauty that we ascribe to it in our own way is just, yeah, it makes me feel really positive, actually. It just makes me feel makes me feel pretty good. Um, so on to the blue men, the next little segment of the chapter. The blue men are found only in the Minch, and chiefly in the Strait, which lies between the island of Lewis and the Shant Isles, or the Charmed Islands, and is called the Sea Stream of the Blue Men. They are not giants, like the Nimble Men, but of human size, and they have great strength. By day and by night they swim around and between the Shant Isles, and the sea there is never at rest. The blue men wear blue caps and have grey faces which appear above the waves that they raise with their long, restless arms. In summer weather they skim lightly below the surface, but when the wind is high they revel in the storm and swim with heads erect splashing the waters with mad delight. Sometimes they are seen floating from the waist out of the sea and sometimes turning around like porpoises as they dive. In days of old, the blue men's stream was sometimes called the current of destruction because so many ships were swamped in it. The people blamed the blue men who dwelt in caves. They said at the bottom of the sea, their sentinels were always on the lookout and when a vessel came in sight, word was sent to the men in the caves to come up. Sailors were afraid of them and many sailed around the Shant Islands instead of taking the shortcut between these and the big island of Lewis. When the chief of the blue men had all of his men gathered about him, ready to attack a ship, he rose high in the water and shouted to the skipper two lines of poetry. And if this skipper did not reply at once by adding two lines to complete the verse, then the blue men seized the ship and upset it. Many a ship was lost in days of old because the skipper had no skill at verse. True is the Gaelic saying, however, there comes with time what comes not with weather. One day when the wind was high and the billows rough and angry, the blue men saw a stately ship coming towards their sea stream under white sails. Royally she cleft her way through the waves. The sentinels called to the blue fellows who were on the sea floor. And as they rose, they wondered to see the keel pass overhead so swiftly. Some seized it and shook it as if to try their strength, but were astonished to find it so steady and heavy. It carried on straight as a spear in flight. The chief of the blue men bobbed up in front of the ship and then, waist high among the tumbling waves, shouted to the skipper, Man of the black cap, what do you say as your prow ship cleaves the brine? No sooner were the words spoken from the skipper, no sooner were the words spoken than the skipper answered, My speedy ship takes the shortest way and I'll follow you line by line. This was at once an answer and a challenge, and the chief of the blue men cried angrily, My men are eager, my men are ready to drag you below the waves. The skipper answered defiantly in a loud voice, My ship is speedy, my ship is steady. If it sank it would wreck your cave. The chief of the blue men was worsted. Never before had a seaman answered him so promptly and so well. He had no power to injure the ship because the skipper was as good as barred as he was himself. And he knew that if he went on shouting half verses until the storm spent itself, the skipper would always complete them. He signaled to his followers to dive and down below the wave ridges, they all vanished like birds that dive for fish. The big ship went on proudly and safely under snow white wind tight sails while the sea wind through the cordage sang with high and wintry 
merry meant. Once upon a time, some fishermen who were crossing the sea stream of the blue men in calm weather found one of the blue fellows sleeping on the surface. They seized him and lifting him into the boat, bound him tightly with a rope. He slept so soundly that although the fishermen let him fall out of their hands, he did not awake. They resolved to take him to the shore, but they had not gone far when two blue men bobbed above the clear waters and shouted, Duncan will be one, Donald will be two. Will you need another ear, you reach the shore? The skipper of the boat was about to shout two lines in reply, but before he could speak, the blue man in the boat opened his eyes and with a quick quick movement, he snapped the rope that bound him as easily as if it had been only an oaked straw, and answered, Duncan's voice I hear, Donald's too is near, but no need of helpers has strong Ian Moore. As he spoke, he leapt out of the boat into the sea. That was how the fishermen came to know that all the blue men have names of their own. Ah, oh, wasn't that fun? Oh my god. I'm having so much fun with this episode. So the blue men of the Minch are kind of like um, kelpies, really, or like sea creatures that exist primarily when the sea is very stormy. And as it said, they only exist in that quite specific location on the water. So some sailors know to avoid them. And their whole purpose seems to be quite mischievous and kind of to drown and stricken boats on the rocks. So I know my music choice is probably a bit too joyous for that, but like like, I was having so much fun, okay? So just, just let me have my moment. <laughs> do, 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 It's just so much fun. And yes, I'm very obviously not a singer. <laughs> but Kelpies are usually um, water horses in Scottish folklore, and they are usually very negative. You know, their whole purpose in folk tales and stories is to drown people, to lure them to locks and things like that. Um, but the Minch is a strait of water that kind of separates the Alp Outer Hebrides and mainland Scotland. So the Blue Men of the Minch are only said to exist in that one bit of the world and I think that there was like a meteor that went um, into that area so there's lots of like spooky theories and things like that from people but the blue men are only said to be um, particular to that area not the whole of Scotland like Kelpies are for example. In fact um, Kelpies actually kind of pop up in lots of different places um, they're primarily Scottish Kelpies um, but similar types of creatures you can find in lots of other places as well. They usually take the form of a horse, but in lots of folk tales they also shape shift and take different forms, but they're always man malevolent. Um, they never seem to be, you know, have anyone's best interests at heart. So I actually much prefer the blue men, at least they like a bit of poetry, you know, fair play. If you're not good enough at poetry, then they will destroy your ship and drown you. It's a, it's a fair trade-off, isn't it? Just learn your verses. I was going to skip, you know, over describing Kelpies really, but I suppose you might as well. Um, almost every body of water in Scotland has some kind of water horse story associated with it. There's also water horses in Wales as well. Um, not quite as terrifying as the Kelpie though. Honestly, just Google pictures of Google Kelpie. There are some really horrifying artwork um, about it. Have I talked about Kelpies before? I really feel like I have. So I'm not gonna go too in depth, but you can email me or message me and be like, Sean, you've literally never talked about Kelpies before and then I can remedy that but I feel like I have whether that's just in my personal life or on this podcast I don't know it's all blending into one for me um, but if not I might specifically talk about them um, or malevolent Scottish as a dog barking in the background and I've had to edit it out so many times but you know what I'm just gonna go with it this time um, this episode has been recorded over a few days so I'm sorry if you'll find that the first part of the episode is like great okay I'm not like tooting my own horn but I am a little bit because I'm very very proud of it and then the second half today is probably going to be 
not so good because there's dogs barking outside there's noisy neighbors and there you go that's just life isn't it i'm sorry about that built up your hopes in the first half of the episode and drag them back down again in the rest of it and um, but we do have a little bit of the chapter left to go and i'll start putting music and sound effects and everything to that as well so hopefully we'll drown out the Oh gosh, no, I'm about to say we'll drown the dog. Um, we don't want to drown the dog. This is not a podcast for that. In fact, we're very fond of dogs here on this podcast. Just not that one outside. No, I'm joking. I don't even know what that one is. I don't know which dog it is, <laughs> which neighbour it belongs to. I'm sure it's a lovely dog, but I can't really pet it at the moment. Interestingly though, Bailey is really silent. So my dog before, Jakey Baby, my beautiful Jakey Hound, um, passed away about a year and a half ago now. He was, I think, 16, and he was the most chill dog ever, but he had a really deep, low bark, and he had a really, like, proper bark. Bailey, now, um, he's only about seven months old, so he's still a little baby, but he's really silent. Um, in fact, um, he's just, there's only been a handful of times that he's actually barked. And one of them was yesterday when my dad told me that he burped and Bailey barked. <laughs> I don't know why I found that so funny, but of all of the times that he barks, it's just ridiculous. Anyway, I just thought that was quite funny. He's really, um, and he's really hyper. He's not chill at all. He's really, really hyper and energetic and full of beans, but he's really quite quiet. And Jakey was just so chill, um, but actually, you know, barked quite a bit <laughs> to be fair and had a real roar, roar, bark. bless him oh dogs um i don't want anyone to think i actually do mean that dog harm i love dogs i am well i say i'm a dog person but i'm a cat person as well i really love cats i don't have one but i would welcome one i love them they seem to like me actually cats do which it, it, i like that when animals like you you know you know that you're doing all right humans mm. ah! I can take or leave it. But when, when dogs and cats like you, then you know you're doing okay. I know for a fact there's going to be at least one person that says something about, well, you don't, I don't care about your dogs. Well, I have to say, I've got to put it out there, my friends. I've got to say, if you don't enjoy accidental Bailey content, then this podcast is just not for you. Okay, there is, like I said, there is an, the next bit of the chapter. So we're finally going to go on to that now that I think the dog outside has stopped barking. Um, we'll see. Okay, let's do it. The green ladies are different from the fairies who are called wee folk. For like the blue men, they are of human size. Some of them are withered old hags resembling Beira in the winter season and some of them are as fair as Beira in her summer girlhood. They have power to change their forms at will. A green lady may sometimes deceive a traveller by appearing before him in the form of his lady love and after speaking to him for a time turn away with mocking laughter. <laughs> and vanish from sight. Perhaps, too, she may appear as a dog. <laughs> oh, God. I'm sorry. Perhaps, too, she may appear as a dog and torment shepherds by driving their sheep hither and thither in wild confusion. Each green lady lives alone in a solitary place, either below a river or waterfall, or in a green knoll, a forest, or a deep ravine. One is rarely seen in daytime, the green lady wanders about in the dusk of late evening, in moonlight or in darkness. She is ever a deceiver, and woe to the traveller who has not the knowledge how to overcome her spells, for she may drown him at a river ford or lead him over the edge of a precipice. It is difficult to fight against her, for if she asks a man what weapon he has and he names it, she can, by working magic, make that weapon quite harmless. One evening, a smith was riding homeward from battle on his horse, and when it was growing dusk, he reached a ford. Suddenly, a green lady rose out of the water in front of him. Stop! she cried. You cannot ride across said the man. Be gone, O oh evil one, so I shall smite you. What have you to fight with? She said. Said the man, I have my sword. Immediately he named his sword. It lost its power to do her injury. 
The green lady laughed mockingly <laughs> and then asked, What else do you have to fight with? said the man, I have my spear. And when he named the spear, it became as useless as the sword. The green lady laughed again. <laughs> Have you room for a rider behind you? She asked. Said the man, yes, and there is room also for a rider in front. As he spoke, he seized the green lady, lifted her up in front of him, threw the reins over her head and said, now I have you in my power. You will never leave the ford, she answered, because your sword and spear have been made useless to you. Said the man, I have still one weapon left. Which one is it? she asked. Said the smith, the sharp bright weapon against my leg. He meant the dirk in his right stocking, but as he did not mention its name, the green lady could not make it useless. Then I will leave you, cried the lady in alarm. Said the smith, you cannot leave me until I choose to let you go. The reins are about you and you cannot move beyond them, for the magic power now has been taken from you and passed to me. The green lady knew well that this was so. She knew also that she would have to do whatever the man ordered her to do before he would set her free. The horse was urged forward by the smith and the ford was crossed in safety. Then the animal trotted across the moor as the moon rose over the hills, shining fair and bright. Let me go! The lady cried, and I shall give you a herd of speckled cattle, said the man. You will have to give me a herd of cattle, but still I shall not let you go. The horse went on, and the green lady wept tears of sorrow and anger. Let me go, she cried, and I shall build for you tonight a house which fire will not burn, nor water or storm wind injure and it shall be charmed against all evil beings. The man reined up his horse and said, Fulfill your promise, and I shall set you free. He dismounted, and the green lady dismounted also. The smith tied the reins around her and repeated his command. Your wish will be fulfilled, she said. Then the green lady uttered a loud cry which was heard over seven hills. The cry was repeated over and over and over again by Big Angus of the Rock, a lonely spirit who is at everyone's service. Big Angus is a son of Beira, and it is told that he was wont to cause his mother much trouble by contradicting her orders and giving orders of his own, for he desired to be king of the universe. Although he was weak-minded and light-hearted, to punish him, Beira shut him in a rock and compelled him ever after to repeat any words that were said in his hearing. Ever since that day, Big Angus has had to repeat over and over again everything that he hears in his lonely, rocky prison. So, Big Angus repeated the cry of the Green Lady, which was a command to fairies and goblins to come to her aid. As these little people fear all Green Ladies, they answered her cry without delay. They came from the hilltops and from inside the cliffs from green knolls and lonely moors and deep forests, and from every other haunt that they loved. Those that were dancing ceased to dance, and those that were setting out on journeys turned back. They crossed the moors, jumping like crickets, and came through the air like birds, and gathered around the green lady, waiting to obey her. She set them to work at once to hew wood and gather stone. They cut down trees in the rowan wood and quarried stones below a waterfall. As they went on working, the green lady cried out, Two stones over one stone, one stone over two stones. Work speedily, work speedily. Bring every timber from the wood, but mulberry, but mulberry. The house was built very quickly. Across the moors, the fairy stood in two rows, one row from the house to the waterfall and one from the house to the rowan wood. The stones that were quarried were passed along from hand to hand, and so were the pieces of timber that were hewed down and sawed and dressed. When the dawn was beginning to appear in the 
the eastern sky, the house was ready, and all the fairies and goblins vanished from sight. Set me free, cried the green lady. The smith said, I shall set you free, when you have promised not to do me any injury. I promise that readily, said she. Said the smith, promise also that neither I nor my children will ever be drowned by you in the fords of the three rivers. He named the rivers he referred to, they all flowed near his home. The green lady promised that also. Then the smith set her free and she cried, You have not named the fourth river, let you and your children beware. As she spoke, she went past the smith like a green flame. He never again saw her, but seven years afterwards, one of his sons was drowned in the ford of the fourth river he had not named, and then he knew that the green lady had taken her revenge. Other green ladies have made friends with certain families, and have kept watch over their houses, shielding them from harm. Once a poor fisherman lost his boat and sat down on the beach at a river mouth lamenting his fate. A green lady appeared before him and said, If I give you a new boat, will you divide your fish with me? Said the fisherman, I promise to do so. Next morning he found a new boat lying on the beach. He went out to sea and caught many fish, and when he returned to the shore, he left half of his catch on the green knoll of the river bank. The green lady was well pleased and helped the man to prosper. One evening, however, he left no fish for her. He went out to sea next day as usual, but did not catch anything. Sad was his heart when he returned home empty-handed, but it was even sadder when next morning when he found that his boat had been smashed to pieces during the night in a storm which had risen suddenly and raged until daybreak. He never again saw the green lady, and he had reason to be sorry that he had not kept his bargain with her. There was once a green lady who received favours from a bold pirate, whose name was Mac in Year. She kept watch over him on sea and on land, so that he was always able to escape from those who pursued him. The green lady advised him to paint one side of his boat black and the other side white, so that watchers on the shore would see a black boat passing to the north and a white boat passing to the south, and thus be deceived, thinking the boat which went out to attack a galley was not the same one as they saw returning. In time, when the people came to know the trick, they said of the deceitful persons, He's black on one side and white on the other, like the boat of Makin Yea. Makin lived to be an old man and when he died the green lady shrieked aloud and passed northward. The shriek was heard in Mull, and ere the echoes died away, she had reached the cooling hills in Sky. Whew, that was a lot. This has been hours of recording across a few days. So hopefully you enjoyed that. It's um, not something I'm going to be doing, you know, every single episode reading from um, like a script or, you know, a book. And um, you know, it's not my style. I'm much more off the cuff. I don't really like to work to a script, but I thought this would be like a little treat. And I got, I got really excited with all the music and the sound effects. So I probably completely overdid it and overproduced it. Um, but hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, it's a little, like I said, very different to what I usually do, but I'm still two and a half years later. I'm still very experimental with this podcast. I'm still trying new things all the time because I'm having so much fun with it. And for me, the main reason I make the podcast is because I love these stories and I love sharing these stories with as many people as possible. So from what I can gather, um, the green lady or a green lady or a green woman or a green maiden even is another word for a glystig or glystig, which is a type of um, malevolent Scottish fairy. But as we heard there, there were some green ladies that kind of struck a bargain with mortals and kind of had their own um, relationship there that wasn't completely malevolent. So that's a thing that I love about a lot of um, folk tales associated with fairies, this striking of deals, because it kind of has this underlying morality to it, doesn't it? Um, and it doesn't definitely gives you this kind of moral tale like you make a bargain of someone you keep your word and if you don't keep your word then they're gonna have revenge or you know you're going to suffer consequences i think they're very good little morality tales 
And again, if you think about it, folklore has had so many different functions. You know, this uh, storytelling has had so many different functions. Storytelling acts as our history. It acts as our morality. Um, it acts as our it acts as family history and genealogy. It acts as purely entertainment. It acts as survival tactics. You know, there are all these different functions that storytellings and folk tales and fairy tales um, are really accomplishing. And I think that's really cool. And I think you can definitely tell that in those specific fairy tales that are associated with striking a bargain and then breaking it because you do see the full consequences of your actions when you fail to live up to a promise. Now it doesn't really explain it in the book but from um, other bits of research that I've done I think they're called green ladies because on their bottom half they usually wear like a green robe, sometimes they can be half woman and half goat, sometimes they can be like a beautiful maiden looking, sometimes they can be quite ethereal looking. These green, these green ladies seem to have various different appearances associated with them in stories. But then in other stories they can sometimes be like guardian spirits, uh, usually with farmers actually, but again there is always that striking of a bargain there or some kind of give and take in the relationship. Now I won't go too in depth because there's lots of different specific folk tales about green ladies. Um, I was just reading that one because that was part of the chapter that I read, but I might do another episode one day um, specifically about these green ladies and about spirits very similar to them in Scotland. Who knows? Um, we've covered the Banshee and things like that, but it would be nice to cover, you know, a similar type of episode for Scottish fairies because there's lots of them. I know we covered Fairyland and sort of um, the Seely and Unseely courts, but there are all different types of fair folk in um, the Celtic nations, as you have probably realised already. So yes, that was reading from Donald Alexander Mackenzie's 1917 book, Wonder Tales from Scottish Myth and Legend. And as I said, I got my text from sacred-texts Dot com. Really great collection there of esoteric books, of folklore books, of mythology books, of historical um, stuff. Lots of really great stuff on that website, so do, do check it out. So I said I was going to do it, so I'm going to do it now. I'm going to thank all of my wonderful patrons on Patreon. Thank you to Aaron, thank you to Abby, thank you to Alex and Alexander and Anne, thank you to Brian, thank you to Blythe, thank you to Carol, thank you to the Celtic Myths pod show. I see you guys over there being a patron of me, thank you very much. That's a brilliant um, podcast, by the way, the Celtic Myth Pod Show. Um, thank you to Celtic Whispers. Thank you to Colin. Thank you to Daniel, the host of House of Legends podcast, one of my favourites. Thank you to Dave. Thank you to David. Thank you to Ed. Thank you to Ellie. Thank you to Heath, Heidi, Ian, James, Jay, Joanne. Thank you to Khalil. Thank you to Keely. Thank you to KLH. Thank you to Christian, thank you to Lynn, thank you to Max, Pamela, Patrick, Richard, thank you to River, Samantha, Samantha, and Siobhan, who is also the host of the Myth, Legend and Law podcast, a lovely, lovely, lovely podcast. And thank you to Stephanie. Thank you so much to all of my patrons, because as I said, without you, I wouldn't be able to get subscriptions to new software and um, you know, things that are going to make my podcast better and more fun and so I can experiment more and, you know, it'd, it'd be great. Um, eventually, I would like to get better equipment. So, you know, I'm just saying, you know, that if you are a patron of mine, your money is going back into the show. Like, it's not going, it's not, I'm not taking it for, like, Domino's Pizza or whatever. Um, I spend enough on Domino's Pizza with my own money. <laughs> but it is going directly back to the show to hosting it to related subscriptions and to eventually like better equipment and things like that so thank you thank you thank you so much um a quick plug again if you become a five dollar patron of me i will record a mini episode of your choice so get on that if you want i'm not charging anyone during this lockdown period because it's, it sort of feels a bit wrong so i'm not going to do that um 
So if you're like, oh, you've, you've released a few things during lockdown, are you going to charge me for all of those? No, I am not. Um, thank you so much for listening to this whole episode. Hope you are keeping well, staying safe, looking after yourself. Much love to you all. Mwah! Until next time.